Okay, so real time we're partnering with Brooks and Nagel. Um, they're the UK experts in IR35. Um, today we've got Rob, who is going to talk us through some common questions that are coming up from clients and contractors that we've been speaking to in the past few weeks. The first question would be um, is from a client perspective. So, um, is it recommended that companies um, only use the CES tool for determinations? My recommendation would be not to just solely use the CES tool. So, if you think of what the CES tool is, this is a tool that HMRC have brought to market to help clients. However, if this, the, this tool, from what we've seen uh, first hand experience, is um, it doesn't help you with hard to answer scenarios. So, the, the pass rate with CES tool, from what we've seen, is 80 to 85% uh, fail. And there's also a, approximately a 10% cannot determine figure either. So one of the elements that the that clients have to have to consider is whether or not they're taking reasonable care. And you can answer or you could ask three different people the same question and get three different answers. So you really need to be comfortable that the person who's answering those questions through the CES tool is answering them in uh, the right manner and also in the way that HMRC would answer those questions themselves as well. Otherwise, HMRC could uh, disagree with those answers that you put in. Okay, great. And does another question would be, would be um, does IR35 mean we cannot hire PSE contractors? No, no, absolutely not. So, um, a, a myth in, um, in the market at the moment is that IR35 is uh, the death of contractors and it's a it's a, a piece of legislation designed to stop limited companies operating that's simply not the case but this legislation is designed to stop disguised employees operating through a limited company uh, and the revenue have acknowledged that uh, approximately one in three contractors don't apply the rules correctly for IR35 so we, in theory two in three contractors should uh, not be affected and should continue as normal. Okay, great. And clients are wondering, um, is there any additional work that they have to put in come the 6th of April and what that looks like? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, first and foremost, the clients will have to make a decision on whether or not IR35 applies. So we need to, to look at their entire off-payroll workforce and uh, there's, there's a variety of ways that contractors can be paid be it limited company, uh, sole trader, through an umbrella company, um, through an agency's internal payroll. So first of all, they need to, to look at their workforce and, and understand which workers are at risk, first of all, and, uh, and which workers they have to make a decision for for IR35. Once they've made a decision, they have to create a, a status determination statement and cascade that information down the supply chain and they have to pass that to both recruitment agency, if a recruitment agency is in the supply chain, but also to the worker. And underlying all of this process, they have to demonstrate that they've taken a reasonable care approach. Now, a, re a reasonable care approach is, is really you being able to identify that you've done as much as you can as an organization to get to the right decision. So uh, a simple finger in the ear or gut feel approach to an assessment would not constitute as reasonable care. Also, um, a, a blanket assessment across a large number of workers, where different roles, different responsibilities and um, uh, expectations. You cannot uh, categorize them all as one type of worker. So really, uh, yes, they will need to have new processes in place to identify which workers need to have an IR35 assessment be comfortable with whichever process that they go through to assess a worker is is is, is the right um, is the right decision, and they can demonstrate if if HMRC do challenge their processes, that they can demonstrate that they have a clear audit process to identify how they operated pre twenty twenty, um, what workers are inside, which workers are outside, who's PAYE, who's not, and the reasons why. So another question we get from consultancies is um, a confu you know, confusion around who is um, liable for the determination. Mm -hmm. So how does that look then? So 
is that in terms of um, in terms of a, consu a consultancy um, uh, completing work for other clients? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So so there's a lot of there's a lot of chatter in the marketplace at the moment around uh, uh, labour services versus a statement of work. Now, if you are providing a statement of work and it's a genuine statement of work, and, and when I say genuine, um, I'm talking more you are completing a project and you have deliverables rather than simply body shopping workers on a tan materials basis. Now, if you are a consultancy providing a genuine statement of work, then in that scenario, you are the hirer. So it's your responsibility to assess those workers and identify who should uh, be inside and who should be outside. Now, there are rules around a small hirer uh, mm. versus medium and large. Small hirers uh, are exempt, so there may be some scenarios where uh, a consultancy becomes the hirer, but is not responsible to make those assessments, mm. and they'll just need to understand whether or not they are, they are defined as a small hirer or not. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question would be, um, clients would be wondering what the best practices are that they could have in place to protect themselves from IR35. Mm -hmm. I guess this, this links back into the first question uh, a little bit here with CEST. So there are lots of scenarios, uh, lots of, of um, tools on the marketplace now that, that you can you can go to, to to get an assessment. Now, from from our side, Brooks and Legal have been conducting IR35 reviews for almost two decades. Mm -hmm. um, we've conducted well in excess of 100,000 IR35 reviews. We, we, we've done this on scale for public sector and also large private sector organisations. It's not just about getting a worker inside or outside. It's about having an audit process in place and strong evidence to document that you've taken this reasonable care approach. So from our side, it's not just a case of reviewing a worker. It's reviewing the contracts, reviewing that entire chain making sure that all organisations within that supply chain are following suit, and to be able to have a, a really robust status determination, an SDS as well, uh, because at any one point a worker could challenge your decision at a later date, and you want to make sure that you've got enough evidence to satisfy a worker if challenged. Okay, great. And final question, just on the, from the client perspective, um, is what if they get the determination wrong? Mm -hmm. What happens? Okay. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's a really interesting point, actually, because um, in a typical supply chain, you'll have a hirer and you'll have a recruitment agency and you'll have the, the, the worker at the, at the bottom. Now, there is dual liability. The hirer's responsibility is to complete uh, an IR35 assessment to create an SDS, to pass it down the supply chain and to demonstrate reasonable care. Now, there is a scenario whereby the client can meet all of its obligations, but still get the determination wrong. Now, the liability does fall down the supply chain to the, the recruitment agency, the fee payer, the closest uh, entity in the, in the chain to the worker, and it's the fee payer's responsibility to make sure that the correct tax and national insurance is deducted. So there could be a scenario whereby the client has met all of its obligations from a process point of view, and the recruitment agency is liable, which is really important as to why the recruitment agency should be talking to the client now to understand how they're making those decisions, because they want to make sure that you are also protecting yourselves as well as looking after your client's best interests. If a client has workers um, that they've uh, sourced directly and not through a recruitment agency, they're both the hirer and the fee payer. So they have a process obligation, and if they get that decision wrong, well, they're also liable to back pay the tax in an eye. Okay, great. And now to move on to contractors, just a few questions that um, come up quite recently over the past few weeks. Um, one of them would be, um, so this contractor would live in the UK, but is doing a contract in the Republic of Ireland, so in the mm -hmm. south. Um, so does IR35 apply to them? Yeah, uh, so... HMRC have actually just recently updated their employment status manual and it has some, some handy tips around international work. Uh, rule of thumb is providing uh, UK tax um, is relevant, then IR35 is relevant as well. 
Now, you may have some scenarios where you have uh, clients overseas and, and workers operating here in the UK. Um, you may have some, some workers operating outside of the UK, but they're residents here in the UK. Uh, probably the easiest uh, thing to do is to, to, to look at HMRC's employment status manual and just see which scenario is relevant for that particular worker. But a good rule of thumb is, providing you take tax is relevant, then we should apply IR35. Yep, okay. Um, another question would be, some contractors are panicking that this is the end of the, the contract market in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about that? Uh, I would disagree. Um, so, uh, I think that depending on the clients that you, you, you engage with now, I, I think there will be some clients that will see this as an opportunity to take workers on as full-time employees. Uh, but for others, there will always be a need for contingent workers. So uh, over the past, uh, we've, we've been in this market now for over 25 years, uh, and we've seen the market continuously grow. Now, there's been lots of different pieces of legislation changes, and certainly in the last 10 years, um, recent stats, but, but we've, seen, we've seen contract and freelancer numbers grow from around about 3 million 10 years or so ago to, to now uh, around about 5 million. So... The, the contractor market is continuing to grow. It's, it's an upward trend. Yes, IR35, for some, will make it more difficult to operate in the way that they wanted to. But again, as I said before, the revenue believe that two in three workers uh, apply the, the rules correctly. Therefore, for 66% of the marketplace, it should be business as usual. Okay, great. Another question would be, um, so the client has done the CES tool um, based on their contract and um, they've answered a lot of the questions um, incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So what should I do in that situation? Yeah, so this, this, is, so this is where a client's made an assessment for IR35. And uh, is, that, is that what internally or through uh, using the CES tool? Using the CES tool. Using the CES tool. Um, so it takes it back to the, to the point that I raised earlier whereby you could ask, different people the same question and get different outcomes. Mm. Now, it's really, it's, it's the client that has the responsibility of making sure that these answers are correct. However, if a worker disagrees with those outcomes, the clients are leaving themselves exposed to a challenge. Mm. Uh, and with the new rules, uh, the, the, the process is that a client has to respond within 45 days. Now, what the client should be doing as best practice is talking to the workers, have a, a, an open, open communication channel with the worker to say, these are the questions, this is how we're going to answer, do you agree? Mm. Now, at that point, you'll have both parties agree or disagree at that particular given time, and what that should hopefully do is resolve any future challenges. Yep. Um, and just one final question then, um, a lot of contractors are wondering, should they automatically get an increase in rate? Should they be put inside R35? Okay. So uh, we, we've spoke to a, a number of contractors and also clients as well. Now, initially, a client's reaction would be, no, we're not increasing rates. We've already uh, forecast for projects, budgets, uh, and, and, and staff. However, what we've seen in the marketplace now is the workers who have operated a limited company will see a shortfall in anything between uh, 20 to 40% in their pay. Now, the risk that a hirer has is that a worker will move to a competitor, uh, may look for a full-time uh, employed job, may retire, they may just move on altogether. So the risk you have is if you don't increase rates, you may lose your ta talent. And I think in some scenarios, um, clients will use this as an opportunity to take workers on as, as full-time employees. In some scenarios, Clients will use this as an opportunity to get rid of some contractors that uh, are not absolutely necessary for the business. But certainly for, for business critical roles, I think there needs to be a commercial decision made on whether or not it's worth increasing rates to retain those workers to make sure that you complete your projects. Okay, thank you very much.